Do you need backup? You got no, ma'am. You got it. Okay. 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 First line of attack is to get enough student volunteers that we run out of volunteers. I'm going to say the guy at the conference, unless you make a good connection right now, you're not going to help. Mr. Chair, Vice President, whoever they love us. The copies are two pages, but if people have the one that's highlighted on the red, it's the same as this one. Okay. So they shouldn't think they have that. Yeah. Sure, that's a great message. Oh, okay, I guess that's the same thing. Sorry. Oh, anyway. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank I think it shouldn't come into the time speak arrangement that was made on presenting the total proposal, which would be a separate vote in favor. So, to, uh, the changes that were made here, if we can put that on the screen. So, uh, so, what's going to be presented here on the screen is showing the changes from what was noticed to the amended proposed version, which is what should have been just distributed now. So, so, uh, what was going to show up here and what everybody should have in their hand now is what I'm proposing the amendment to. And we'll have a discussion on that amendment and then we can go back to the actual proposed Bible. Can we play that full screen? Okay. So yours this is color. different. I think they were just made in black and white. Is that what the difference is? Or? It is. It is. There's so many copies circulating. Oh, no. <laughs> they need to say first edition, is, second this edition. This is actually different than the black and white copy. It is? Where? The, the D is different right here. What the, okay, what so the, the changes are occurring different. here yeah. in the, the lower paragraphs. Um, the, so the, the top this one? was debated so as being out of scope or not, even though that's just a, a change of uh, where the position of the one goes. Um, so I, I, would, I would let the body decide if that's so, out of scope or not, but I'd just like to speak to the important part, which is just below that, so we can scroll down. So uh, what this is talking about is, is changing the, the uh, effect of what is addressed by this in the first year. So this is stating the candidates in the first and second congressional district, uh, House Districts in Utah in 2018, and then all party candidates thereafter fell assigned to So just, just to explain the difference between this, speaking to the amendments, is we're, we're only addressing candidates in those two districts. We're trying to phase... We're, we're trying to phase this in, so it's not all at once, and specifically the, his the effort is to not impact any candidates that have already filed to gather signatures. No candidates in Congressional District 1 or 2 have uh, signified intent to gather signatures. So running this bylaw would not have impact on any existing candidates, no existing campaign strategies, no races that are already in there. And if this takes effect, then it would only affect candidates that file after knowing that the bylaw is in effect, and that they would be forfeiting their membership based on that. And we're going a little bit out of order here because I still want to speak to the entire thing, but I'm just talking about the amendments so that we can then speak to the discussion of the entire proposal, uh, but that, that is the, uh, the key difference there. And then in paragraph D, uh, the party secretary and any other officer shall file objections with the note that shall file objections with the stage while candidates on a key membership forfeiture. The final paragraph to 8C and she'll, and she'll do so in 10 minutes at fourth Utah code. And then uh, paragraph E is replaced with the executive committee, any officer or committee tasked to oversee election modification or inform representative and the current members of the state committee at the time of litigation filing shall bring legal action in the name of the party to ensure the state's now are valid candidates, objections, and challenges in the courts. 
the committee's officers in accordance with fine jury under the agency authorization standard bring legal action in the party. So the the amendment here is intended to respond to some concerns about the board applications. It is attempted to change the scope of its impact for the year 2018, not to include any candidates that have already signaled intent to gather signatures. I would move that we amend it and then have a discussion as a whole for the entire thing. But I, I think that uh, most of us here would agree that the amendment that was noticed is not a Proposal that was noticed is not something that we actually want to see take effect. So I, I would motion that we amend it to this version and then have a discussion if that passes on the amended version at that time. Request for information. Uh, is that you, Kurt? Yes, sir. Good. I would like the proposal, or, uh, or, uh, Mr. Chair. My question is if any of these changes uh, are on the advice of some council, uh, what legal uh, opinions has he relied on in order to shape these proposals? The uh, individual would like to know if there was a legal counsel consulted in these changes. Yes, uh, Marcus Mumford, our legal counsel in the SB 54 litigation, as well as Morgan Philpott and Chris Troopers, who all had an involvement as well, were all consulted on these changes and uh, it was based on their recommendations. Second. The parliamentarian says that uh, if we amend this document with this candidates in the first and second congressional districts of 2018, it should be a proviso or not in the actual documentation itself. So that it doesn't reflect that from year to year to year to year. So what are the Can you bring it here up here so we can talk to you about this? Okay, the discussion is uh, any bylaw change you want to make, you want to make it good from now until the time. And so uh, they'll pull out the 2018, put that in as a proviso, so that it drops off once that date has been superseded. I think this is so it's not changing the context, it's just changing the format of the document. Point of information. The, in uh, stating that it's the first and second congressional, uh, congressional house district, the, is the motion intent to be the two house seats in those districts are all candidates. But they know the first, just the U.S. congressional, those two U.S. congressional seats. Is there, is there some 
Is there some learning that would be clarified? I'll add that in the proviso to be clear. Are they taking that in right now? Yeah. So, in paragraph C, all party candidates who fail to sign, or sorry, all yeah, fail to sign a candidate certification. So that's remaining in here. The part that was, was taken out from the, the copy that was distributed is where it says candidates in the first and second U.S. congressional district. So this applies to all candidates as it is here. And then if we scroll down to the end. So with the proviso that in 2018, these provisions shall only apply to candidates for the first and second U.S. congressional house districts. So that, that is for those candidates running for those seats, not any candidate that happens to be running for anything in those districts. So is there, is there any question on the wording or what's been done with the proviso here? I have one question. Uh, does party candidates mean state party candidates or even you, uh, you know, county party candidates as well? All of the records. So all, all party candidates in, in paragraph C. For no, all candidates. All meaning all state candidates or all, you know, and any candidate for nomination by the Republican Party in the state. As far as, as, far as the electoral process, the state only recognizes the state parties so in fact all Okay, are you ready to speak for this? Uh, so I, I believe I've spoken for the amendments. Um, so I, I, the, the reason that I want to make these changes is to address legal concerns and to limit the scope of the proviso so that it only affects candidates in those two districts 
for those two seats specifically so that it does not impact any candidate that has already signaled intent to gather signatures or any candidate that's already engaged in campaigning for their whatever seat they may be running for so as to avoid complicating existing races and to make it appear as if we're trying to target specific candidates or anything like that. We're not trying to do that, we're just trying to establish it in a limited scope so that we can have it take effect without interfering with existing candidates and then next year or from here on it will take effect as uh, for all candidates and they're planning to for that ahead of time. So that is my reason for uh, asking about to this amendment. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Stuart Have you spoken? Well so the, the I've spoken to the amendment which I believe was separate to the speaking arrangement for the entire process. Yes. And it was seconded. Okay, have you moved to adopt it? I moved to adopt the amendment. Okay, that motion has been uh, moved and uh, seconded. Uh, is there any debate? All questions. Questions have been called. All in favor of any debate on the amendment, not on the, on the, uh, the amended proposal, not the entire proposal. Could you amend the copy that we already have now? Yeah, so we took out this part about congressional districts. to adopt the new provisions. It's all, it says, uh, all party candidates. All in favor? But then this is a proviso or slides. All in favor of any debate? Two quarter vote required. Please stand for your Thank you. Take your seats. Those opposed, please stand for your Okay, the motion passes. Great. So we still need to vote on the amendment. Yeah, yeah. I have been thinking so difficult here. I'm tired. All right. Uh, I apologize again. Uh, now the vote is to begin the debate is to accept this amendment uh, as amended. See below. All in favor of that, please stand and raise your hand. What was the question? This is the vote to accept Thank this. You. Thank you. All those opposed, please stand raise your hands. Thank you. Uh, that is uh, amended as printed on the screen now. Chair recognizes the very Thank you. Do you have copies of the changes now as currently amended versus the original bylaws? Like those would like to be distributed so that we can talk about the entire proposal. We can take just a second to distribute those, please. Thank 
Are, are we ready to speak to this yet? We're just trying to get it up on the screen there, right? Mr. Chairman, I would like to propose an amendment to technical changes. Okay, hold on a second. These two proposals are completely different than the one we passed. This is completely different. Yeah. Let's take baby steps. There's so many copies floating around. Like we did the last meeting, the agenda. That's right. We did. <coughs> <coughs> if we decide to keep Stuart, won't talk to us, he'll be in. 
You will. Okay, you're in my studio. Let's bring that into the next meeting. Is that the school against that? Is the sponsor? Okay, there's no one against. All in favor of post voting, definitely to the next meeting, please stand for your attention. Thank you, all opposed. Please stand and raise your hands. That motion fails. Turn your faces. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I just point of personal privilege, I guess, because I wanted to speak actually for that last motion and didn't get up here in time. But I'm concerned with this. Um, I, I'm a big proponent of the caucus system, and I understand what this is trying to do, and I think you know, it makes sense from a lawsuit perspective. But at the end of the day, our number one priority needs to be to get Republicans elected this year. We've got an election year coming up, and we've been told by some, I know some of our legal counsels said we're good to go. I think this is too risky. It, puts, it could potentially put um, our status as a QPP in question. And to come up on an election year like this is just, this is, we can't do this right now. So. I'm not going to cut you off right now, Amy, but I'm going to say that we'll debate this later after the three people okay. present, and then we'll entertain that discussion. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure, so to me, this is a different motion that people might agree with. I'd like to refer it to the CMB committee instead of saying, I want to defer it to come back at a very specific time. Clearly, this is not ready for prime time. A lot of us spent time over this week reviewing and determining whether or not we agree with the proposal that is not before us. There are a lot of legal ramifications of this, and I would like it to go to the CNB committee in order to be cleaned up and get ready for this committee before we vote on it. So my motion is to, to, do, is to refer it. So the motion on the floor is to refer this uh, back to the CNB committee. Motion's been seconded. Still before it, we have a, a Peter Kim. Yes, Peter Kim, Kings County. I just speak in that I believe that we are all intelligent enough to read the words on the screen. There are not very many words that have changed since it was published at the announcement. And I believe we are intelligent enough and understanding enough that we can make a decision today. This is time sensitive. We've all voted. Meeting after meeting after meeting, we want our lawsuit to proceed. This is necessary to our lawsuit as well as to our election. If we don't vote on it now, that means you want count my vote to succeed. You want to do away with the caucus system. Don't vote in favor of this proposal. Would anyone like to speak for the motion to the song? Hello, uh, Mr. Chairman and party. I appreciate the opportunity to say this. I realize I may not be intelligent enough, um, but while I can read all the words and probably understand most of them, I think that we should be a deliberative body that should be more transparent and try harder to be more inclusive rather than produce something this hastily where we've spent so much time debating whether we have the current copy of this. That's a failing of us collectively. If we didn't have it before this, it's not like this legal strategy is new. This is not new to 2018 or even 17. And while I appreciate it a lot, changes over time, um, we should be more thorough and debative. I mean, clearly, here we are this afternoon, we have no problem with debate. So why the need for such haste? I'm in support of deferring this until a later time. Uh, against? Yes, I'm against. Okay. Um, yes. I think what we really need to do, rather than having keep having motions to defer or to table or whatever, let's listen to the three people that have been assigned to speak to us, and then we can make a an executive or an, an educated vote about whether it's ready or not. If we don't have those opinions, how can we make the, that that judgment? I honestly think we just need to go forward with the plan of the three people speaking, and then after that, if you want the table or if you want to do those things, then bring it to the body. But you'll be educated, I believe, in what they're trying to do and the words of what they say. So that's why are, we ready? are we ready to vote? All the questions. Okay, uh, all in favor of any debate, uh, our three quarters, please stand and raise your hand. Two thirds. Okay. Thank you. 
<laughs> All opposed, please stand, raise your hands. Okay, then two thirds. The debate is now. The vote is now to uh, the motion on the floor is to refer this proposal to the CMB committee. All in favor of that majority vote, please stand and raise your hands. Those opposed, please stand and raise your hands. The motion fails. Are you ready to present? Great. Just about. So, yes. Applause for the people doing it. Thank you. So this is our only copy. What's up on the What's on, what's on the screen is what so, we so have. So to clarify, what is on the screen is the correct version, and, and what has been passed down. So the, the latest copy is not correct, but the copy before that would be correct. It doesn't show changes. If in, the back, you, if in the back you can't see this, please feel free to move forward. Okay, so we can now start the time based on the motions for the original speaking arrangement. This this uh, proposal here is to modify the bylaws specifically to give a ramification to what is already in there, requiring the candidates follow our constitution bylaws. This provides a penalty so that candidates that willfully violate our constitution bylaws realize that they will be forfeiting their membership in the Republican Party. This presents it in a way that uh, only applies to candidates in congressional seats one and two, as was discussed in the amendment, so that this year it doesn't apply to any candidates that have already started gathering signatures with the violation of the Constitution and bylaws as they stand. The purpose here is, as our legal counsel in uh, the SB 54 lawsuit, Marcus Mumford has pointed out to this body in, in times in the past, is that we're currently litigating a hypothetical argument where there isn't necessarily standing against a party member who has lost membership or been penalized for failing to follow the prescribed methods of obtaining nomination through the party. This provides a circumstance which would allow for a real event to occur that would create an actual situation, not a hypothetical, that could then be litigated. In the event that something does happen to follow against this, where a candidate in those two races would enter by uh, seeking nomination outside of the party's prescribed uh, platform, uh, Constitution and Bylaws as methods of obtaining that nomination, the candidate would do so knowing that they would be forfeiting their membership. At that point, the uh, LG's office would, would continue to certify them, and then the party would be required in the bylaws here, as, as proposed, to, uh, to dispute or um, to contest the candidacy of any candidate doing so. The way that the law is written right now would put us in a fast track to have that litigated through the courts, and we would have a ruling on that before the primary, which is before anything would take effect to impact that candidate, which means that if that does happen, that the candidate would have the issue resolved before the primary, before their membership would actually be forfeited. This allows for the courts to make a ruling on the, the situation at hand where we control membership, and as Judge Nifer has pointed out in the previous arguments, that the, the party base does maintain control of its membership. And that is the correct way to deal with uh, the issue of people bypassing the uh, stated methods of, of seeking candidate nomination through the Republican Party. In so doing, we create the real circumstance that the courts can litigate, gives us a fast track to the court, and also creates a second scenario where we would have an opportunity to have this ruled out by the courts, which would not impact anything that's currently being dealt with by uh, the 10th the District Court as they're reviewing the SB 54 lawsuit. This actually creates a better standing, as has been explained uh, while, while this is being drafted by our legal counsel, Marcus Mumford, Morgan Philpott, and Chris Troopas, creates a better case to give us a better opportunity to win this have it litigated to completion before the primary this year. It does not impact the SB 54 lawsuit that's also going on, as that case is not allowed to take on any additional evidence, which puts two positions for us to 
strike down SB 54 and to resolve the issue and put the party back in control of how we nominate. That would resolve the issue completely and move us back in a situation where we as Republicans can move forward and do what we do in getting Republicans elected rather than spending all of our energy debating back and forth about what routes are acceptable and what's not and whether or not the signature route is acceptable or people should be able to bypass the party process or whether the state has the right to tell us we can or can't. This would resolve the issue finally and then we would be able to go back to just being Republicans all on the same team. That, that's the intent, that's the goal, that's the way it's stated, and that is under advice from our legal counsel, Marcus Mumford, Chris Trubis, and Morgan Philpott. So with that, that is my motion that we vote on this, and I would also like to ask Helen Red, and this can be counted towards my time to be able to comment with her legal opinion on it as well. I think that's beyond the scope of the vote, specifically by name, so. Allowing her time to be beyond the scope. Now it's a uh, uh, here for Mr. Penny. All right, thank you for this indulgence. Let me just uh, say a couple things. First of all, I agree with, I think everything I just heard Brady said, except I think there's another part of the puzzle that I think you need to be aware of and understand. In other words, with respect to teeing up the issue, this plan would tee it up much better than what is currently teed up. Number two, um, well, that's the part I agree with. Let me just back up. I think we want. I want to run you through a little bit of the of the uh, statutory structure that causes my concern and is the legal risk that this path would cause. So, in SB 54, it sets up two types of political parties. The first is a registered political party. Um, you can see there, this is not a path by which you can go to um, the primary ballot through a convention. You can only go through a petition scenario and you get 2% of the registered voters. Next slide. Then there is the QPP. Go on to the next slide, please. The QPP is what the Republican Party is currently. The QPP allows two paths. Path number one is through the Convention system. Path number two is through the petition system. You actually have to get more petition signatures to go through that system, and um, and that's that's the system we're under right now. We have to qualify for that, as the word would, um, as the term states, and we did that last fall. Would you go to the next slide? This continues on on the definition of a, a QPP. It, and the C two is the big point here permits a member of the registered political party to seek the registered political party's convention process in accordance with section 28-9-407 or seeking the nomination by collecting signatures in accordance with the provisions of 2408. Um, you can skip the next slide. Go to slide five, if you would. It says the following provisions. Yeah, the following provisions. Number four, the qualified political party shall comply with the provisions of section 407, 8, 407, 408, 409, 408, again, next, signature, next slide, is the signature gathering process. Um, here's my point, very simply. Um, as I read the amendment, it says, I agree not to attempt to access the primary ballot through any methods or processes not explicitly outlined in and sanctioned by the Utah Republican Party Constitution and Bylaws. So in other words, if you want to be a candidate underneath this bylaw, what you are saying is you will not seek through petitions. The state statute says specifically the party has to allow to be a qualified political party. In other words, to have a convention, you also have to allow people to go through the petition procedure. Now, if I had a D in front of me, which I never have and never will, but if I did and I was representing them, I would wait for us to make the first move. And if the Republicans go out and say, hey, we're disqualifying you because you went through the petition process, I would go to the courts and I would try to disqualify every one of our candidates and say, the qualified political party requires you to allow a petition candidate. Therefore, this candidate from the Republican Party, which doesn't allow petitioners anymore, is DQ'd. 
I have to tell you, I think that's a good argument. I think it's a strong argument. Can I tell you it will prevail? No. Would I give it 60, 40, 75, 25? Yes. And if you draw, if you draw the right, the wrong judgment, bad things happen, right? And I would advise you to consider that risk. That's a risk all throughout. The other thing is, is if I was the Democrats and I had the money, it seems they always do, somehow, I would pick off our candidates that have the least money to fight and try and trip them down. So it's a very powerful litigation tool. My point to you is, oh, with respect, um, this wouldn't affect the current lawsuit at all, as I see it. The record is set on what's before the Tenth Circuit. Um, if you're looking for another lawsuit here, it's going to give you one, and it could give you a lot more, including some to put every candidate we put forward at risk. Anybody, anybody has any questions? That's all I got. I can get much deeper in legal theory, but that's too painful for me to do. So, anyone? Uh, Mr. Chairman, is it, is it appropriate to ask questions, or do we have to wait for all the speakers? Let's, let's wait for all the speakers, and then if you'd like to ask questions, then we can do that. Okay. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Bateman if you'd like to come up here. He's uh, coordinating his slides right now. Well, let's come. Oh, up here. Unless you need to see the slides for help you out. Your choice. Well, this is quite a surprise, and uh, debating uh, Utah State Code with an attorney. My, I might find myself a little bit out of my element here, but I, I'd certainly like to address it. Um, so, so first of all, um, one thing that I'd like to say about, well, what, what I want to talk about kind of three phases is I want to talk about the legal elements, just address that to the extent that I can. I want to talk to the people here today who really want to preserve the caucus convention system, and I want to talk to the entire body. Um, so the first thing that, that I'd like to pull up is while QPP status is defined, those of us here who believe the caucus convention system should be preserved, we don't believe that SB 54 uh, is a constitutional law. Therefore, we have to address it, we have to challenge it, and this is the way that we challenge it. Um, when you, if you don't believe a law is constitutional, there has to be a mechanism. State code has defined a mechanism for us to challenge it. And that's in this, um, it doesn't look like this. So 20A-9-202, uh, interesting. I'm not seeing it, but basically I was referencing the code, uh, Utah State Code, where it, uh, it lays out and defines the process by which a uh, political party can challenge the candidacy. Um, of an individual, and it's a, an objection process. And when that happens is you have five days, uh, and maybe we can pull up the next diagram that I sent you, Peter. Um, but you have five days after the candidacy declaration period in order to challenge an individual's candidacy. So by doing this, we're merely following the law, um, and we are uh, going through the process that, that the law designates. Uh, another thing that I'll say with respect to QPP status on this is the SB 54 gives no power to the lieutenant governor to revoke QPP status. It's not there. I'll also say that our QPP status is already being challenged in the courts, in the 10th Circuit Court by the Democrats. This is not a new risk. The risk sits before us today. Judge Newfer ruled against this risk, and he said, no, you don't have standing uh, to bring this before the court. Um, if, as you look at this timeline here, you see here March 9th to March 15th this year is the candidate filing period. March 15th to 20th is the objection period. Now, if we get into court and the, this same state code that we tried to pull up unsuccessfully uh, fast tracks the process to be able to challenge in court uh, our um, uh, objection if we aren't happy with how the lieutenant governor comes back and rules. So, um, if we lose in court, these candidates whose membership is forfeited will be put on the primary ballot. So there's no harm done to the candidates if we lose. If we win, then the candidates will be removed in the law, and the reason is because the state overstepped its bounds and 
overexerted itself with respect to the freedom of association that the party should have. So, as I talked with Mumford about this issue specifically, and this was a concern to me, Mumford said, I do appreciate people's concern with this, uh, but I personally am not, I am not overly concerned about it. And part of it is because this will play itself out uh, before we get to the primary election. The, the law is designed to fast track the litigation of this. So, so that's one comforting thing. The other thing is, if it ferrets itself out by the time we get to the, uh, the primary election, um, and the candidates, let's say we lose and they make it onto the primary election ballot, there still would not be any more standing than there is in the 10th Circuit Court today uh, to uh, force a revocation of QPP status. So that's the best I can do with respect to my perspective of it. But again, I would, I would say I defer, Mumford was the one that said uh, that he was not overly concerned about this issue. Um, the, second, the second thing that I wanted to talk about is just why we need to do this. Uh, what Marcus Mumford explained to me is that courts do not like to rule on hypothetical issues. Uh, they, they like to address real world issues. Right now, because we have failed to take this step, we are litigating a hypothetical issue and it weakens it. Marcus Mumford told me, and I have been told Chris Trupas has urged the party over and over again for four years to do this. And so uh, the gentleman who uh, stood up and spoke to why are we doing this all of a sudden, this is not all of a sudden. Um, this has been in the works, it's been being discussed for four years, and it's actually been very, very well thought through. Um, so so, so that's, that's one important element there. Um, <clears throat> In addressing all of you, whatever side this issue, of this issue you're on, what I've, I've learned a lot coming into this party, and that is that people, people are passionate about both sides of this. And, and it's created some, I've heard people refer to it as a civil war in the party. And it's unfortunate because both people, we, we have way more in common than we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, separating us. And yet we are so caught up on this issue. And the reason we have a legal system is so that we don't duke it out and end up shooting each other, we can go into the courts and we can address this issue. And that's what we need. The case that we have in the Tenth Circuit today is weak. If we lose, the Civil War rages on. We need to decide, let the courts decide which way this is going to go, and one side's going to win and one side's going to lose, but there is, we will never have finality to this if every two years, one group does a ballot initiative to flip it one way, two years later, the other side flips it back. Nobody's ever going to give up on either side of this. The court is the only mechanism that we're going to have to, to decide this. If we don't do this today, we just extend the civil war by two more years. And that's not good for the party. It's not good for all of us. When the dust settles on all this, we're going to be working together for years running this party and, and nominating and selecting candidates. We need to let this come to a head in the right structure, in the structure that our attorneys have urged us to do since the start. Let this be decided, and when we work the right case through the court system, none of us are going to have any choice but to accept the results when we get done with it. So I, I just hope that we can take this step instead, because if we don't today, maybe it's two years, maybe it's five years, maybe it's ten years, we're going to get here, this is going to happen, and that's how we're going to come to a conclusion on, it, on all this. Why extend the Civil War ten years, or five years, or two years? Let's do it now, let's get it done with. I think that there were some questions. Brady, if you could come up here with, with Dave and Stuart, if you want to step down here, and, and uh, if, as long as we can field questions, let's, let's do that. I want you to be as as possible uh, with reasonable time here. So let's take 10 minutes, ask a few questions, and, and answer these. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. I move that we end debate. It seems like we've heard from two people, three people now, for and against. And it seems to me that there's plenty of information. It's time that we actually vote on this. Okay, the question's been called. Uh, the uh, question's been called to be two thirds to end debate. Uh, well, we haven't, we haven't even debated this, so uh, but the, the question's been called if you want to end debate on this or discussion of this. Two minutes.
two-thirds vote. All in favor of ending this debate and voting, please stand and raise your hands. Just take your seats. All who want to continue this, please stand and raise your hands. The motion fails. Uh, the debate will continue, and uh, let's go to the question and answer. Is, do you have a question? I do have a question. I have a question. Yes. Um, so my question is of a legal nature. It's for anybody who'd like to respond. But there was some discussion about the legal risk to the party of making these changes and what the state might do to so to sort of enforce the law that we sort of talk about as SB fifty four, so to speak. So my question is, if the state were to act, and I know there's been some discussion about what that mechanism would be. And I think there's lots to discuss about what mechanism would the party use, you know, revoking our QPP status, can they do that, decertifying candidates, et cetera. But my question is, whatever action the party may take against the party, or sorry, whatever action the state may take against the party that would harm our candidates, that action, would that not trigger an almost certain granting of a temporary restraining order. Yes, no, what are the chances? That's my question. Okay, I think, I think there's two things. Let me, let me start with number one and number two. Number one is, is you're saying if the state, uh, if the lieutenant governor revokes our QPP status. I think that's one path. I think there's a second path too, where the Democrats go to court, and I, I have to tell you, I think there is a, I think the Democrat, a Democratic candidate would have standing if he's saying someone on the ballot is there wrongly. I think he'd have standing because he'd have harm right there because there's someone that's done that. So th those are the two paths where we could lose our QPP status. Now, what you're asking is could the party or could the can affected candidate go in and get a TRO to stop, to hold the status quo? I assume that's possible, but you're gonna have to show as part of the TRO that you're likely to succeed on the merits. And as I read that statute, I think you could make a good argument if you're the Democrats or the Lieutenant Governor's office to say, listen, you're not likely to succeed on the merits because you have, you Republican Party, have said that you will not allow your candidates to use the petition. Therefore, you're not a QPP. You're not going to win on the merits. I, I, think, I think you might be able to get, I, I hate to get too hyper-technical legally here, Josh, but I think you might get a TRO the last three days but I don't think you're going to get a preliminary injunction that gets you through the through the primary or through the general election. Could the merits also be considered the merits of the party's lawsuit with the state over the validity of the law itself? Are you talking about the current lawsuit? Yes, or a new lawsuit. I, if there's a new lawsuit, it's hard to speculate on that. With the current lawsuit, I think most judges would look at that and say, Jashufer's already ruled that there's no problem here. Yes, you're appealing that, but pending the appeal, we're sticking with Judge Dufer's ruling. Which substantively says what in, in regards to this issue? It substantively says there's no violation right now of the uh, First Amendment right. I shouldn't say that substantively, it practically says that. So I'm confused about something, so I want to talk about that, and then I have another question. If you'll if the show will allow me. Do you want to that? So, if, you address that? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is that the, 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 the chair recommends? Um, so, I'll just say something really quick. Uh, so, uh, you guys all know the lieutenant governor has great political ambitions. The law does not authorize him to revoke QPP status, so it'd be a bit of an overstretch. Um, do you. <laughs> Do you believe the, that LG is going to take action to kick out two of our U.S. congressmen, half of our state legislature, and scores of other seats throughout the state in one fell swoop just to stick it to us because we are trying to ferret out the constitutionality of an issue? I guarantee you that the state legislature would come together and in a special session and address this issue long before that ever happened. Um, and that isn't even why Marcus Mumford is comforted about this issue. It's because this issue is already before us in the Tenth Circuit, and there's no standing. And this process would play itself out. The lieutenant governor would force compliance with the law, even if we revoke membership or whatever else. So there, again, would be no harm to anyone, and there would not be standing. So 
So on multiple different levels, it's just extremely unlikely that this possibility, that's already a possibility regardless of whether we do this or not, takes place. I just want to add to that or emphasize the fact that the, the party would be forced into compliance and that it would be litigated before the primary. So there's not really an opportunity for standing to exist long enough for the uh, Democrats to litigate it faster than we have a ruling for the court and it being resolved before the primary takes place in the primary terrain. So my understanding, and I believe all three have agreed that this will generate litigation. And what I think I'm hearing you say is that we want that because we want to challenge the law based upon what the judge said before about our ability to control our own membership. Is that what I'm, what I'm hearing? Okay. So my question is then to the chair and to uh, Mr. Bateman. Does our agreement with Mr. Bateman to um, cover our legal costs, because this is a separate lawsuit, does that agreement to cover our legal costs include any litigations generated as a result of this action? Um, I don't, I would have to go back and look at the specific language to see if we mentioned by name the cases, perhaps. Okay. Um, I'm absolutely committed to funding it. I'd rather, much rather fund this than ballot initiative. Um, I could probably end up funding both, but, um, but it's, you know, this, this is the, this is the suit to fund, not the 10th Circuit. Um, so certainly I'd be much more excited about litigating something with a higher uh, probability of efficacy. And is the chair's opinion that it is covered in that agreement, or would you want to have an addendum to cover it? Um, it's not in front of me right now, but my recollection is we identified the two. We identified the first lawsuit that got dismissed, and then we identified the one that's on the We did specifically. So it, it, it covers those two lawsuits. Not this no, not any future So uh, then my last question is, thanks for letting me take some enough time. Then, Mr. Bateman, would you be amenable to adding an addendum to that agreement that covers any litigation for this action? Yeah, the every dollar I spend on this new suit would go much further than the one on the existing one. Thank you. Yes, yes. Okay. Would you speak to what, in what the real world example that you're making to, to trigger this? What it would look like? Uh, so the the real world example that we're looking to trigger is that if a candidate actually does lose their membership, that creates a scenario where an event has occurred that is challengeable in, in litigating. So we would we would challenge that membership. The the LG's office would push back and and. Uh, Try to continue to qualify them, and then we would litigate that against the state for not being able to control our membership. So this this creates the opportunity for that to occur in either the first or second congressional district, should a candidate choose to do so during the delineated timeline this year. And I'll add to if you look at the nuances of the language in here, you'll see the great lengths that we went to to make sure this does not bring harm to our candidates. Um, that, that is our first priority. And while we figured this out and figured it out, we gotta figure out a way not to harm our candidates. And of course, there's gonna be one candidate that does get in a predicament where they go against the grain on this. Um, we specifically found, as mentioned before, uh, two congressional districts where no one has yet uh, declared an intent to gather signatures. And when I say congressional, I mean U.S. congressional districts, um, which means that we, we felt like it's fundamentally unfair to change the rules on a candidate in the middle of a cycle. This does not require that. If now that the rules are changed, if someone does declare candidacy, they do enter into a situation where they're subject to membership forfeiture. So these two congressional districts, if in this cycle someone happens to uh, follow a path to the primary ballot that's not sanctioned by the Constitution bylaws, we'd be in a situation where we'd have the opportunity to go down a path to uh, bring finality to this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would, I would just note in part of your question, um, what this does is it it will put up, in the current lawsuit, like they mentioned, there's a whole bunch of hypotheticals that the judge will dealt with. This gives very specific points of issue and it will change a lot of the standing, a lot of the other issues, and clarify them for the court, but it will also change kind of how they're analyzed as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, so my, my question is really just kind of a follow-up to something Stuart said, and it's also called the Josh's question. It's mostly for Brady, I guess, so I'm just kind of keep the time short on this one. Um, so in your presentation, you presented first, and so you hadn't heard what Stuart was going to say. Uh, he mentioned the possibility that all Republican candidates across the state would be subject to individual challenge by a Democratic challenger because of this. What, what, what was your thoughts in response to that idea that any, that any individual, so if somebody running for county recorder in San Juan County could now be challenged as a candidate because of this decision individually? So that would all be based on our QVP status. So any candidate would only be able to be challenged based on illegitimacy if they can reach the ballot, not following QVP standards. So the, the, I guess my thought to that would be that that would be resolved based on whether or not, I mean, they, they couldn't charge an individual lawsuit against every single candidate. It would be a suit that's based on whether the party has QPP status. If we have QPP status, then the candidates are legitimate. If that is challenged, then that would be resolved through the litigation process. And then I believe that would be resolved before the primary gets there. It would actually occur sooner than a challenge could be made against those candidates by any Democrat opponents, because that would happen. The litigation would occur before the primary, and Democrats will only stand against them in the general. Okay, so just a quick follow up then. Um, so you said resolve before the primary. I mean, resolve suggests that the judge would have ruled. What if he rules against us and we're no longer competing? If that happened, but if the judge rules against us, then it, uh, it forces us to reinstate the candidate, and we're still not violating QVP sins. So that the candidate would, would incur no harm, and the, the process would not be violated for QVP, and the candidate would still exist on the Primary. That was different. What was Stuart? Stuart, I don't know if you want to respond to that. And then I, that so I, I think you're being a, I think if you're a judge sitting in front of you, it looks like it sounds to me like Brady envisions three options. Envisions option number one that the judge can order no Republican Party, you can't do that. Or, and reinstate those candidates. That's what I was understanding you say, right? The other option the judge can look at is no Republican Party, you've already made your decision, and we will put it, I assume, in a complaint of some sort of a judicial filing with the court saying that we're expelling this person, correct? Right, which I'm just can see saying that they couldn't use the petition process. Once we've done that, if based on their membership, if they have forfeited their membership because they would because they use the petition process. If I'm the Democrats on the other side, my argument is very clear. You, Republican Party, have filed a filing in court that says that you you cannot be a member of the Republican Party and go the petition around. As a result, you are judicially stopped from arguing otherwise in any court this state. I that's not an argument, it's not an argument I would want to stand in front of the judge anymore. I'll just put it that way. Uh, by the way, that, that comment right there is the reason I really wanted this to be privileged. I think that that is the rub of this entire issue. I think uh, to Norm's point earlier about this being uh, going to any county clerk or any kind of candidate across the state is a false statement. And the reason is because this is limited to two congressional districts in this state for this election cycle. Is it not? No, I think it, if you read the first sentence, it is in two congressional districts. No, if you read A, it's candidates who wish to obtain the nomination of the Utah Republican Party to run as a Republican. Then scroll down. Created by the. With the proviso that in 2018 these provisions shall only apply to candidates in the first and second congressional house district. So that's true for this year. That is correct. But with respect to if we challenge, so let's say somebody tomorrow walks in and signs up for petitions to take on Rod Bishop, starts down that process, we challenge it. The Republican Party then says this guy who did the petition is out. What the Democrats are going to argue is that our entire party, every candidate who went through the QPP process, should be disqualified because we are no longer a QPP. Will a judge not deal with reality and a specific situation and not some hypothetical? Judges are going to deal with the law. And the law says that what's the, the what, what's the reality the versus the hypothetical? The reality is, is that the Republican Party has filed a complaint against the candidate that says you went through the petition process, 
you have lost your membership as a result, you're no longer a Republican, you can't run for us. So the judge is going to say the Republicans are saying their members can't run as QPP people, or they can't run as petition candidates, they've lost their QPP. First of all, all the, 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 keep in mind here, I believe the candidate is forfeiting their membership because they're violating our bylaws. There is no re revocation on the part of this party. It's the actions of the candidate that are uh, essentially forfeiting their membership. I, I, I see your point, but I think you're kind of twisting the words there because what's happening is, yeah. if I, no, no, wait, if I want to be a Republican, I, if I want to run for the Republican nomination under this system, I can't do positional signatures, is that correct? For the U.S. House, for, for uh, District 1 and District 2 for 2018, yes. Okay, and if I want to do that, I can't do it, right? And then well, you, you, you could, but you're choosing to forfeit your membership if you do. Right, and so parties say I can't do that, and that's enough to violate the QPD status. Well, again, it's the candidate making that choice. They can go through the convention. No, even okay. the judges, even the judges have said that the convention's uh, path is the only constitutional path. The required number of signatures in House and Senate districts have essentially been declared as questionable. They weren't declared unconstitutional by Judge Newford, but they were declared questionable. Like he, he may not, it's okay because the, the uh, convention path is constitutional. Is that not what that court said? It did, but it allowed the petition path to continue on. The petition path is a viable path right now. Allowed, well, not allowed. Because we didn't have a specific situation which this will create. Thank you. Hey, can I go? Are, are you, okay. I have a question that is kind of different. In my opinion, and this is my opinion, and I'm not an attorney, but since 2014 when the legislature passed Senate Bill uh, 54, we have been led around by the nose of the Republican Party with Senate Bill 54. We have to follow it. It's the state law. I'm not really happy with it. And then in 16, our candidate that lost at the convention is now a congressman. So I'm really worried that 18 is going to give us another candidate that's not our convention candidate. Senate Bill 54 is still the law. And I I just wonder if the longer that we establish this precedence of accepting and living by Senate Bill 54, if we're ever going to get a ruling that goes against it. Seriously, what if the courts rule against Senate Bill 54 now, what does it do to John Curtis? Um, if the court, if the, uh, so we'd have to take two rulings. We'd take an overturn of the 10th Circuit, you'd have to go back to the district court for further litigation. If, if SB 54 was turned over at this point, it would just mean long going forward elections would be run pursuant to whatever the state statute resulted there from, from that ruling. Okay, thank you. Um, Marcus Jessica's my I had a question. So given the hypothetical that this only impacts two con two congressional offices, the people running for house in in the first and second congressional district. Since we're an executive meeting, is is there is there a movement among anybody in here to actually file a candidate in the first and second congressional district to have them get signatures so you can have standing court? I only say that because if we if we if 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 we if you don't do that, let's say we right now, I don't know. If you do it in 2020, an example, this could actually impact like Stuart. My, my words with Stuart was saying all those people that collect signatures could be challenged, thus possibly narrowing the scope of, of doing it earlier rather than later. I don't know. I just, I just want to ask. Uh, so I'm not personally aware of anybody who's planning, but we haven't even passed the bylaw yet. Um, yeah, so supposing it passes. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, however this ends up one way or the other in this legal case, whoever steps up and does this, uh, it will probably have streets named after them. And this is a huge, this is a defining issue in the state of Utah. So I would be utterly shocked if someone didn't choose to um, make themselves the, the focus of attention on this, much like Rosie Parks did during the Civil Rights Movement. <laughs> Uh, my question is uh, for Stuart. Stuart, I just have a question on your 
clarification. If it gets if it gets pushed down to Judge Newfer, Judge Newfer has never ruled on membership. Is it, is it, has he? Has he? No, that, that's what I was saying. It would take two rulings because he's never gone in. Like if if, if the party wins in the tenth circuit now, it'll go back to the trial court. By the way, it won't go to Judge Newfer this week. As long as Marcus is counsel, he won't take cases from Marcus. So it'll be kicked to another judge. Um, he and Marcus got into it another case, and you can ask Marcus sometimes. It's a really fun story. But um, it would go down, it would get kicked to one of the other judges, and then the, all the issues that are in the complaint are so going way, way back with him being with him. See, and, and I guess my question is what do you think about, have you followed new first comments about, or do you kind of, have, having been there in the court case, he knew it, almost hinted that we should, this was the way to challenge it. No, I think, I think when I got up, I think, Right after Brady spoke, I got up and said, listen, I agree that this is a much better way. I agree with almost everything Brady said, and this is the way to frame the issues. I, well, I, don't know, I think my next sentence was, though, is that it's fraught with risk that I'm not sure we can control. Okay, but, you know, as a as we can control. Yeah, as someone that wished we would have done it, who advocated for us to do this for you, I, I agree with what, what Dave Bateman has said, is that, you know, I mean, let's face it, I'm the poster boy for this issue. I wish we would have dealt it four years ago. But I also believe that there is a civil war. There is two factions, and it will continue, like Dave said. I'm a big believer of let's throw everything on the table, have the court case, and, and if we lose in court, we lose in court, you know, this is the reality. But as long as the possibility is out there, uh, I think we're going to keep doing this. So let's let's throw everything on the table. If we lose the court case, then we lose the court. One of the one of the things I, I totally understand your point of your perspective, but the, the response I would have there is, and I, I advise clients on this all the time. Sometimes when you open Pandora's box of litigation, you don't know what you're going to do. And the collateral damage on this, the risk of the collateral damage on this, in my mind, is huge. I, I can't tell you what the percentage of risk on that is, but I think it's substantial. I think it's substantial. And you, know, you pay lawyers to keep you out of trouble, right? And that's the perspective I'm trying to give to you guys today. And I, and I, and I appreciate that. Chris Cohen, you haven't served in the legislature, though. I do back up what they said, is that if that were the case, then you were to throw everything out. I truly do believe that you would have a, a special session. Because you're not, you're not, and that's a, I guess that's a political call, not a, a legal, a legal call. The concern I would have is you'd have to enact legislation that was ex post facto or work retroactively. Not certain how that plays out. I'll just say really quick that there already is risk. Maybe we're adding incrementally more risk, but Rosie Park took, took risks, and this is worth it's worth the risk to end 10 years, 10 more years of civil war in the party. We've got to get this to come to a head, and this is the path. And I. I'm utterly confident that our LG uh, and Nora Judge is going to kick out half the Republicans out of office in the state of Utah without the, the legislature stepping in. Half of which would be kicked out are the le state legislature to address this issue before it comes to that. It's, it's an impossibility for me to see loss of community status. Thank you. Yeah, I would just say the same thing. We're talking about putting the, the worst case scenario is the problem falls back in the lap of the legislature who brought us to 54 to begin with. That they created the problem, they would be able to solve it at that point just as easy as they have before. They would definitely go in a special session, not just stand by with this much notice knowing that they will lose their seat automatically. Mr. Chair, you think this mic still works? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Clark Cox, Salt Lake County. Um, just a, a, a comment and a question because I think it's been very clear. The reason that I would have voted against the original proposal, uh, sorry, um, I know you're not speaking ill of the sponsor, is two things. It's because I believe that it would have created a no win scenario uh, where uh, if the bylaw passed, the only way to a GOP candidate is the convention route, but if the party loses its QPP status, the only way to get on the GOP primary is a reduced number of signatures, but the candidate loses their membership for election and they're banned from the ballot no matter what the past. So that's the reason I didn't like the original proposal. 
Um, and it's kind of a worst case scenario for me because I'm a candidate. The other reason that I would have voted against it is I'm challenging another Republican in the office who signed to get to gather signatures, and therefore, as an SEC member, I would not have voted to strip that individual of his party membership. Um, whether I agree with him or not, the fact that I'm running against him, I just thought it was the wrong thing to do. So I appreciate you changing the scope to the two congressional districts. The question that I have is in 28, 28-8-101, 28-8-401, which um, Judge Newper referred to the first one, but it specifically says that the party has the ability to, uh, to, to set its membership requirements, and it specifically says that we can set the membership requirements in the Constitution or bylaws. So you're, we have the ability to do this under state law. We can do that legally, um, but we are, you are correct that we are violating SB 54, that we're challenging it, and I sat in the court, both in the, in the Supreme Court's office and in Nuffer's, uh, and they both said this situation was not right. They, they used the word right. I, I'm not a judge, but that's what they used. Yeah, ripe as in fruit. Um, but anyway, so they, would, they were kicking the can down. They would not rule on this because of this situation didn't exist. It's my understanding, and I just want to clarify it, that your intent is my nightmare would have messed up my race and anybody else's that I know, uh, including you know Representative Dunnigan and others that are in the room. But this is the only going to kick in for the first and second congressional districts currently known as filed to gather signatures. I checked that this morning. Um, it's a Republican, and as far as I know, the only Republicans running in those races are going constitution, going the convention route. So your intent is for that particular uh, candidacy to be contested, that that race to be contested in court, leaving everything else alone. If the Democrats uh, question our QPP status, they failed in federal court, they failed in state court, they appealed that to the federal court, that's still in Denver. Um, this may give that situation brightness, for lack of a better word, and I don't know what will happen there, but as far as as far as the party's QPP status, um, when I heard Dave Bateman had heard, heard my complaints, and so did several other people uh, over the last week, and I believe that this fixes my biggest concerns as far as any specific race being affected. And I just want to make sure that I'm clear, because the last thing I want to do is to vote on this today and mess up somebody that's running for Utah House 30 that's currently an incumbent uh, that I'm running against. So. Yeah, that is correct. It was specifically amended so that it would not have any impacts on any existing candidates or any existing races. Currently on the race and making decisions based on the law and the bylaws that they were at the time they applied. Thank you. Let me just mention that. I think once the party files a complaint and says one of its, I guess, then former members has forfeited his, um, forfeited his membership and because he went through the petition status, I think if I was a Democrat, you're always. You know, Ninety percent of the races in the state are running as an underdog. I challenge you. Under the party's loss of students. So, uh, may I may I uh, ask the leader of the for just one second? Uh, I believe I have a, a suggestion because I've heard everyone say that this is the, actually a better route to the table. I would like to uh, ask unanimous consent that we amend the proviso to add this. And that no provision of this change shall go into effect until there's a written agreement from a donor to be responsible for the legal costs. In other words, I just want to make sure that we have an addendum or whatever in place uh, in writing to, to specifically cover this. Would you like me to uh, repeat the motion or does the secretary have it? Repeat. And that no, uh, no part of this change will go into effect until there is a uh, 
written agreement in place to be responsible for the legal costs associated with this change. And then I, uh, I suspect that we'll be ready for the question. Yeah. Uh, I did want to ask one more thing that hasn't been addressed so much. Yeah, I'll get back to that in just a second. I, uh, hearing from Mr. Bateman, I think he's not a man who's already offered that. Is there a second? Second. 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 Mr. Chair, do, do we get, if we've been standing in line, do we have an opportunity to speak? The question has been called, so let's, uh, after this, we're going to talk. Okay, so this change is in the note, uh, after the proviso. So to add to the end of it, and that no part of this change will go into effect until legal, a legal contract is entered into to cover the legal costs. Okay. Mr. Chairman, yes. I would like to make an amendment to that today. Okay. I'd like to move that the CDC be the entity of the Republican Party that negotiates that additional agreement with. <clears throat> In representing the party with Mr. Mr. Bates. Negotiate an actual duty agreement with the gentleman. I don't believe, since I just demonstrated the ability to enter a contract with Mr. Bateman, I think that authority still resides in the chairman, not the state central committee. I don't think the central committee can give that authority away from the chairman to do that. I think the state central committee has already given that kind of authority to the state central, to the uh, CDC. In, in what fashion did, did you mean? What I mean is this committee, both in December and in January, reaffirmed the CDC's authority to enter into contracts with uh, respect to litigation on this issue. Okay, the, actually, I signed a contract with Mr. Baker. The authority was also granted to the CDC in those same motions that were passed in those meetings. I'm not trying to argue, I'm just saying, if you want to make it legal, we need to get it right. And no part of this uh, change will go into effect until after a legal contract uh, negotiated by the CDC. Is entered into to, to cover the legal costs. Yeah. Is that acceptable to her? I'll read it again to add to the proviso, and then no party of this, no part of this change will go into effect until the legal contract is entered in, uh, legal contract negotiated by the CDC is entered into to cover the legal costs. Okay. All right. Uh, that's, that's the bit. That was made without objection. Mr. Chair, I would yeah. like to object to that. Uh, might be a potential legal cost because we don't know if that's going to go in there. Okay, uh, this amendment is now up for discussion within the body. Does anyone like to speak uh, for and against this? Is there a second to the motion? There is no second for the motion. The motion fails to read the required. Mr. Chair, what, I'm sorry, I was the maker of this motion. What was the motion that you're denying? Service motion fails because of what? There is no second. Do you well, second? I second this motion. Okay. Then uh, I ask the second that you want. Okay, we got a second on this, so now uh, Mr. Mayor, will speak for this. You can. Uh, I'd like to see you speak. I think this is a problem. 
uh, years ago, even months ago, I voted for the Republican Party to enter into a lawsuit without any guarantee of payments for the lawsuit. This is a fight that is existential for the Republican Party. We don't make this fight, we don't make this kind of change only when we have a guarantee of payment. I don't care if it's guaranteed or not, we fight. This is the Republican Party and this is our substance. We can't let this in. Okay, there's no for it, so uh, debate is terminated. All in favor of adding to the end of this uh, proviso, and that no part of this change will go into effect until after, uh, until a legal contract is contract negotiated by the CDC is entered into to cover the legal costs. So we read more time. And that no part of this change will go into effect until a legal contract negotiated by the CDC is entered into to cover the legal uh, costs. All in favor of this uh, majority vote, please stand and raise your hand. Okay, we're ready. And that no part of this change will go into effect until a legal contract negotiated by the Constitutional Defense Committee, please spell it out, is entered into to cover the legal costs. Goes that same. Are there? Are you ready to vote? Okay. All in favor of this, please, uh, this amendment to the uh, proviso, please uh, stand and raise your attention. Okay. All those opposed, please stand and raise your attention. That uh, amendment is stricken. Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask what our what our group is planning to do to mitigate the risk by if we pass this entire bylaw proposal. They've talked a lot about risk. What are we going to do as a body to deal with the political fallout once we make this choice? Are we going to do a video? Are we going to do a handout? Are we going to do um, a message to in the, in the precinct packet? How are we going to get the word out so that we control the narrative and not Raleigh or Salt Lake Tribune or the Democratic Party? And who will uh, take no, the reins of that? There's no discussion on that. Uh, I would let the Constitutional no. Defense Committee come up with uh, a uh, script and we can cut that video and get it out there. All the questions. Mr. Chair, I will. Questions have... been called. Uh, all in favor of any debate voted on this uh, two thirds requirement. Please stand raise your credentials. Thank you. All those uh, opposed to the debate, the standards of the Okay, the debate uh, is over. Now we're going to vote on this motion up here. Is everyone ready to, uh, we're ready to do that? No questions? Yay! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> as far as two thirds, uh, let me count it. Bill. Bill, all in favor of this as uh, displayed on the screen, please stand and count it. Yes. 
Sure what part of this you don't agree with? The risk? There's risk if we don't do it. We're already there. I'd rather be on the, I'd rather be on the offensive, but that's I respect it. I'd rather be on the offensive than on the defense. But that's all. I respect you. That's my seat. <laughs> Wait, uh, one brother wasn't counting. What was your number? Sorry. All Yeah, a motion passes by Darrell Martin. Uh, that by law is enacted. 48 to 21. The next item on the agenda is consideration to authorize the technology committee. Chairman, are we still on the next session? Uh, no, we can go to the This is your this is your own. Okay, the next item on the agenda is consider, uh, consideration to authorize the technology committee to authority to represent the party in any legal matters associated with the name. Trademark infringement. It's very discussion. Chair, sure, Thank you, Mr.